Welcome to this channel, which is a class on research methods by Dr. Lydia Wabugo. This is a class where we discuss everything social science research, from understanding the research discipline, research philosophy, the elements of scientific research, and the methodologies of conducting research. Feel free to ask any question regarding today's lesson on the comment section. Welcome. Welcome to our class today, which we are going to look at quantitative research designs. In our previous lesson, we have discussed the differences between quantitative and qualitative research approaches. We have said that the two approaches are different because they subscribe to different paradigms and have different philosophical assumptions and beliefs. For the next couple of lessons, we shall be looking at designs emanating from each of the approach. Today, we are going to start with quantitative research designs. Please note that there are some researchers who also call designs uh, approaches because Designs are the plants that collect either quantitative or qualitative data. So before we delve into quantitative research designs, let us first acquaint ourselves with the lesson outcomes. At the end of this lesson, you should be able to, one, differentiate between a research design and a research method. Two, discuss elements of a research design. Three, describe factors that determines the selection of a research design. Four, explain the three main quantitative designs as used in social science research. Please note that the first three outcomes are laying the foundation on research designs, meaning they are also applicable in qualitative research. So let us begin by asking ourselves this question. Can we build without a plan? The answer is no, meaning that you must have a plan which an architect puts on paper and then a contractor implements the plan by building the house that you need as per the plan. In the same vein, we are asking ourselves, can you conduct research without a plan? And the answer is no. Now, why do we need a plan in research? The plan is to guide you as you collect data, analyze data, interpret data in order to answer the research questions or the research problem. So what are we saying? We are saying that as a researcher, you must have a plan that you use to fulfill your desire to solve a social problem. That plan is what is referred to as a research design. Therefore, a research design is a master plan of how and where data are to be collected and analyzed in order to answer the research questions or test research hypothesis. So let's look at how authors define designs. So one of them defines a research design as the procedures for collecting, analyzing, interpreting, and reporting data in research studies. Another one looks at a design as a blueprint that enables researchers 
to come up with solutions to research questions and they guide him or her in the various stages of the research. So looking at the two definitions, you can clearly see coherence between what the others are talking about. It therefore means that designs are the plans that guides researchers in all the stages of research so that they know the procedures to use to collect data, to analyze, to interpret, and to report. The design also enables a researcher to determine the methods of sample selection, the instruments to use, and the statistical tools to use or the analyzing method to apply based on whether the data or the approach is qualitative, quantitative, or mixed method. Then what are methods? Methods refer to the strategies that are used to collect data on research indicators. In our coming lectures, we will look at methods. Now let us look at the elements of research design. Research design encompasses the following elements. Number one, the research approach. And with the research approach, you are asking yourself, is my problem going to be answered using the quantitative approach, qualitative approach, multi-method approach or mixed method approach. It also encompasses methods of data collection. In other words, the design should describe the development of the instruments, how they will be administered and when they will be administered. It also encompasses the population the sample size that you will determine from the population and the sampling techniques that you will apply when you are determining the sample. Then finally, it also encompasses the methods of data analysis. It asks the question, will I use statistical procedures or will I use inductive analysis or will I use a combination of both? Remember, statistical procedures are applied when you have collected quantitative data. Inductive is for qualitative data, whereas if you have a mixed method, then you'd have to use a combination of statistic and inductive analysis. Now we move to our outcome number three to look at the factors affecting selection of a research design. What are these factors? Factor number one is the research problem. What kind of a problem are you investigating? What type of questions do you intend to answer? Do you require quantitative data, do you require qualitative data or both? So the research problem determines the type of design that you will select because the design will answer the research question or the research problem. The second factor is the purpose of the study. Is your study descriptive? Is it explanatory or is it exploratory? That again determines the design you will choose, whether it is the one that gives you data that you can describe, data that explains, or data that explores. Factor number three is researchers' knowledge and experience. As a researcher, are you more experienced, in other words, are you more comfortable collecting quantitative and analyzing it 
Or are you comfortable collecting and analyzing qualitative data? Or are you experienced in both? Factor number four, population of interest. And the question you are asking yourself is, do I have a population that is accessible? Or do I require a sample that is information rich? What type of a population am I interested in? So that if it is a large population that is accessible, then you go for a quantitative design. On the other hand, if you have a small sample where you want to deal with information rich respondents, then you deal with qualitative research. The other factor is resources. How much time, and maybe even in terms of money, is it available to conduct research? Remember, qualitative is a rigorous approach. So do you have the time, do you have the resources to conduct the research? And finally, producers of study findings. Who are the recipients or consumers of your findings? Do they prefer narrative reports? In that case, you go for qualitative research. Or do they prefer statistical reports? In that case, you go for quantitative research. So those are some of the factors you put into consideration as you select a research design. And as we said, those factors and the essential elements apply to all the approaches. So now we move to look at quantitative research designs. We have three main quantitative research designs. The first one, not in any order, is survey. Survey can either be cross-sectional, it can also be longitudinal or correlational. The other type of quantitative is ex post facto or causal comparative research. And the third one is experimental, which is either true or quasi. So now let us move together as we discuss each of those designs. And we start with survey. What is to survey? To survey is to question people and record their responses for analysis. Therefore, survey is a non-experimental design that is used to describe the characteristics of a population by use of a survey or a questionnaire. A survey can also be defined as an attempt to collect data from members of a population in order to determine the current status of the population with respect to one or more variables. From the two definitions, you can clearly see that the main purpose of survey is to describe the characteristics of a population. That is why some research others will talk about descriptive design or descriptive survey design because survey is describing the characteristics of a population. We have said that surveys include questions in which participants report about their attitudes, preferences, opinions, beliefs, activities, emotions, thoughts, and behaviors in a systematic manner. What are the key characteristics of survey? One, sampling is often done for a large population. Sampling in a survey is normally probability sampling. And it is determined 
where every member of the population is given a chance to be part of the sample. Why are we sampling from a large population? This is informed by characteristic number two. It is because we intend to generalize results obtained from a sample to represent a population. Characteristic number three is that data is collected through questionnaires or structured schedules. Some of these structured schedules could be interview schedule, observation schedule, etc. We also collect data using tests and examinations. Characteristic number four is that variables of interest are measured numerically, meaning that we collect numerical data. So variables are quantified. Lastly, many responses can be obtained in a survey, especially if you administer it online. Please note that in survey, just like other quantitative designs, we collect numerical data using questionnaires and statistically analyze the data to describe trends about responses to questions and to test research hypotheses. We have three main types of survey. The first one is called cross-sectional survey. These are the surveys that are administered at just one point in time. They give a snapshot in time and give an idea about how things are for the respondents at a particular time that the survey is administered. So when you talk about cross-sectional, you are talking about the time when the survey is being conducted. So the survey that describes the characteristics of a population at a particular point in time is called cross-sectional survey. Then we have correlational survey. Remember we discussed correlation and the relations in lesson eight. And we said that when two or more variables are related, they are said to have a relationship and we measure the relationship using correlation. Therefore, correlational survey is used when a researcher wants to describe in quantitative terms the degree to which two or more variables within a population are related. Remember, correlation does not mean causality. It only describes the relationship between two or more variables in a population. Type number three is longitudinal. This is also referred to as a follow-up study. These are the surveys that enable a researcher to make observations regarding a population over some extended period of time. We have three types of longitudinal survey. Number one is called trend analysis method. This investigates how a population being studied changes over time. For instance, a researcher interested in finding out the characteristics of adult learners would survey adult students in a particular course in that particular year. This would be followed by annual surveys of adults enrolling in the course. The annual survey of beginners would continue until sufficient data is gathered to enable a discussion on trends in the characteristics of adult learners enrolling in that course.
course, meaning that the researcher would sample beginners every time we have beginners in that particular course. The other method is cohort method. In a cohort study, a group of people with the same characteristics are followed over time. However, same population is involved, but a different sample is selected at different periods of the survey. For instance, a researcher might be interested in the career development of engineering students who graduated between 2000 and 2007. The researcher might choose to survey different samples every two years for a period of five years. Note that the sample selected is different, but the population is the same. The population are all those students who graduated between 2000 and 2007. Panel is the same sample at different times for a period of time. So it is similar to cohort, only that now one sample, the same sample, is followed at different times for a period of time. For instance, in the study on the career development of engineering students who graduated between the years 2000 and 2007, the first sample of graduates that is drawn would be followed over a specified period of time. Having looked at survey, we now move to design number two, which is called X post factor design or causal comparative design. X post implies from after the fact. In other words, Ex post facto design studies after the fact. What does this mean? It means that causes are studied after they have exerted their effect on another variable. What are we talking about? We are saying that this type of research investigates a problem by studying the variables in retrospect. We are saying that the changes in the dependent variable have been observed, or they are observable. The main concern of the researcher is to determine the factors that brought in the changes. I hope you can see why we are saying it is after the fact. Because the change has already occurred, the work of the researcher is to ask him or herself, what are the factors that brought in the change that is being observed in the dependent variable? This design is interested in determining whether there is a relationship between or among variables that is causal in nature. That is, does one variable cause a given variable? And in this case, when we talk about causing, we are saying the change that we are observing has already occurred. So what caused the change? And this method is adopted instead of experimental because many of the cause and effect relationships under study do not permit experimental manipulation. And the question we need to ask ourselves is why don't they allow or permit experimental manipulation? It is because the researcher does not and should not manipulate the IV. The researcher deals with already formed groups. For instance, when a government implements a new teaching methodology, 
And the researcher wishes to study the effect of this teaching methodology on the performance of the students. He or she goes after the fact, after the implementation of this intervention has taken place. So the concern of the researcher is, is the performance as a result of the teaching and learning methodology that has been applied or is it because of other factors? So note that the researcher does not select the groups that will be administered or that will be taken through this new methodology. He or she will deal with already formed groups. In our case, it will be already selected schools or classes where the new methodology is being applied. Therefore, the differences between the groups is not brought on by the researcher. It is not the researcher who came up with the intervention to bring in the change. He or she is going after the intervention has been put in place, dealing with already established groups, and now his or her work is to determine has this change been brought about by the intervention. This design mimics an experiment in that comparisons are made between two or more groups of individuals with similar backgrounds who are exposed to different conditions. The cause and effect of the relationship between two or more groups is then established. So the work of the researcher is to discover whether differences between groups have resulted in an observed difference in the IV. The causal comparative study is a study then where the researcher attempts to determine the cause or reason for pre-existing differences in groups of individuals. What are the limitations of this design? One, we have said that the researcher has no control of the groups. Number two, the cause and effect relationship he or she is studying may not be what it seems to be. It may be a spurious relationship which we are going to discuss in the next lesson. Number three, results in this study are very tentative. Why? Because the cause and effect relationship may be reversed because of limitation number two. And finally, to yield satisfactory results, repeated measures may be required. Now that causal comparative and correlational designs measures relationship, then what are the differences between the two? One, causal comparative identifies relationships or differences between groups while correlational design identify relationships of variables within a single group. Number two, causal comparative includes categorical IV and or DV, but correlational determines the relationship between continuous or quantitative variables, which we discussed in lesson four, and lesson five. Another difference is that causal comparative provides better evidence of cause and effect relationship than correlational. Correlational only tells us the relationship between two variables. We have two types of causal comparative research. Retrospective causal comparative research where the researcher begins investigating a question when the effects have already occurred and now they determine whether one or more factor or variable influenced or brought the change. Then we have prospective causal comparative research, 
which happens once a researcher starts a study beginning with the causes and then evaluates the effects of the condition. Retrospective is more common than prospective causal comparative designs. Finally, design number three is experimental designs. Experimental designs determines cause and effect. That means they determine causality. Causality tells us that variable A caused variable B to occur. Our next lesson will focus on experimental designs in details. So we have come to the end of today's lesson. Today we have discussed quantitative research designs. We started by defining a design where we said that the design is a master plan that enables the researchers to answer the research question or questions. We have said that there are three main quantitative designs. One is survey, which can either be correlational, cross-sectional, or longitudinal. The second one is ex post factor, which is also referred to as causal comparative. And the last one is experimental. In our next lesson, we are going to discuss experimental designs in details. I'm sure you don't want to miss this lesson. So thank you for being part of this class today. I hope this lesson has been helpful. Feel free to comment, like, and share this video with your friends. If you'd like to attend more lessons like today's, please subscribe to this channel. Until the next lesson where we shall discuss experimental designs, it is bye for now. Thank you.